Hello and welcome to those of you joining online right now. Uh, today we will be joined and hosted by two experts in the field, Susan Cole, George Clinical's Global Head of Therapeutic Strategy, Oncology, and Regional Head of Project Operations in the USA and Europe, and Professor David Thomas of the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. Uh, we'll be covering the future of oncology trials, obviously, and giving very specific examples how genomic profiling can be a major step function in getting these trials up and running and efficiently done so. Susan, I'll hand it off to you for your uh, introduction. Thank you, Bradford. Uh, happy to be here today and speaking with David of this groundbreaking work that Amico is doing and uh, with their oncology platform in Australia and how we are working together. I think over the years, patient identification has only gotten more challenging. This is really exciting to discuss what has, I think, and continues to be a challenge in our industry, which is patient enrollment in these types of trials. So as I prepared for our discussion today, um, it brought me back to an article I wrote about 15, 16 years ago in this, on this topic. It was challenging back then, and it really still is now, and maybe even more so because of the enhanced requirements. And so here we are with precision, precision medicine, hearing about that, precision oncology is on our minds. We hear it in the news, in the publications, and on television even. So with that, I will turn it over to you, David. Thank you so much, Susan, and it's great to be here with you all to talk about why Australia is a fantastic destination for conducting clinical trials and why we hope that you'll see Australia as a place to come and bring your business. So what I'd like to talk to you all about today is a federally funded national program that's been established in Australia over the past few years to provide the fundamental infrastructure to identify the, ra the rare cancer patient populations for clinical trials that Susan was just mentioning. We've, to do that, we have assembled together the country's leading cancer centers into a non-profit organization called Omeco, which provides that precision oncology platform. So a little bit about Australia. For those of you who are perhaps less familiar uh, with the country, we're a population of 24 million. We have about 145,000 annual cancer diagnoses in 2020 and about 48,000 cancer deaths. So cancer is the leading cause of death in higher income countries worldwide. Australia has a fortunate track record of uh, uh, cancer care. Uh, we have amongst the leading five-year survival of 69% now for newly diagnosed cancer patients, but that still leaves about 440,000 Australians living with cancer and who, uh, in our view, um, uh, as a country and as a research organisation, would benefit from access to clinical trials. So a little bit about the background to uh, the challenges of precision oncology and why we think we've come up with an innovative and uh, efficient solution to support drug development and clinical trials. This uh, diagram is not necessary really for anybody who works in the drug development field. It's an expensive, long and inefficient process. And that's been well described over the past 20 years. The inefficiency is illustrated by the collapse of from 10,000 lead compounds, once you've identified a potential therapeutic target, down to one FDA approved drug. And that process takes in excess of 10 years. The total costs of drug development therefore exceed a billion dollars per drug. And much of that is related to the cost of conducting the clinical trials in the second phase of the process. The success rate once you get a lead compound into a phase one study is less than one in five. From a drug development perspective, not only is the process costly, but it is time critical because getting that drug to market is what sustains businesses. So how do we improve that? And how, has, how have the parameters that determine those factors changed over the past 20 years since I was a young medical oncologist? When I started medicine 30 years ago, this was not a, 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 a landscape which would, I would find recognizable back when I started. But the reality is that in 2018, of the 850 odd drugs in development, 91% are either targeted small molecules or targeted biologics. That means that rational drug development designed to hit a particular target is really central now to the whole enterprise of drug development. How has that affected clinical trials? Well, back when I was a young resident in the 1990s, uh, this was the way we used to conduct trials. We'd take a drug whose function we would not fully understand. We would look for patient population typically defined by histology or anatomy, say breast cancer. 
We'd find 20 patients and then at a cost of roughly one and a half million dollars in current costs, uh, we would perform a, a cl clinical trial to see whether there was any evidence of benefit. We were looking empirically just to see whether it would work in this population or in lung cancer or in colorectal cancer. Now, what's happened is that with rational drug development, a drug is expensively designed to target a particular mutation, a genetic uh, identifier. That genetic mutation is not uh, routinely available through clinical pathology reports. So we have to find a target which might be present at 1% of the population. So that introduces into the clinical trials design the challenge of screening 2,000 patients to find those 20 patients at a cost we estimate today of around $5.7 million, assuming it costs about $2,800 to perform the screen for each patient to identify that 1% population. The trials costs, let's assume, haven't changed, 1.5 million, which means the total drug development costs for that trial have moved from 1.5 million to 7.2 million. And moreover, finding those patients takes time. You have to screen 2,000 patients. It might take you three years to accumulate those 2,000 patients, and that's time that we just don't, we can't afford. In effect, with rational drug development, the costs of finding the target may, in some cases, amount to 80% of the total cost of the trial. In Australia today, all of this is done in parallel. So for each trial, a budget is allocated to the performance of that trial by each company, to screen those patients independently, despite the fact that one single test can cover the whole lot, which means for 50 biomarker dependent trials being conducted within Australia at the moment in various cancer populations, of the $360 million being spent on the conduct of those trials, $285 million is spent redundantly screening across each of those 50 trials. The solution as we see it is for the government to take responsibility through OMICO to undertake screening on behalf of all parties who wish to conduct trials and to do that once rather than 50 times over. In effect, what it does is to reduce the cost of each individual trial from 7.2 million for those 20 patients down to 2.7 million, a massive 62% reduction in the cost of conducting the trial. But more importantly, provided the screening occurs across the entire country, we start to be able to find those patients faster. So the trials are conducted more quickly, they reach their endpoints more quickly, and so drug development itself is accelerated. To be able to achieve that, we had to create the company Omico, which is a nonprofit organization federally funded to undertake molecular screening and therapeutics in support of trials. We also have a program in personalized risk management, which I won't discuss today unless there's interest. We also are recognized that it's critical with the advent of this new technology, the very principles of precision medicine are going to require whole systems to change and adapt, to take advantage of the opportunities to bring the wonderful advances of science into the clinics where patients are treated and to do that at scale. So one of our programs, the Molecular Screening and Therapeutics Program is based around the simple concept that if we screen as many patients as we can to identify patients who might benefit from participation in clinical trials that we can accelerate and make more efficient that process, bringing more trials to this country. Uh, so a question about that, though. Um, in the U.S., there's a lot of uh, testing that goes on regularly with, with patients. So are you, uh, is the program then taking that, uh, taking in its place um, otherwise uh, standard testing? Is there some standard testing being done? So the current standard of testing in Australia is that is applying across the entire country is typically single gene testing. So you do a single test for ALK or ROS, maybe in some cases, small panels. And generally speaking, those tests are directed towards existing proven therapies. They're, so to speak, backwards looking. They're looking at uh, drugs, defining eligibility for drugs where the evidence has already been generated and the drugs are in the marketplace. They tend not to be forward looking at, at the pipeline of drugs which are coming down uh, through drug development trials from pharma, the pharmaceutical sector. Mm -hmm. So there are institutions in Australia, just as there are in the US, which provide systematic screening at those institutions. But of course, each institution captures a tiny fraction of the total market. Uh, that is to say, if you wanted to screen all uh, 
48,000 patients who are, have advanced cancer in Australia, any institution won't be able to cover all of those patients. And in fact, that's the message that I wanted to give about the network. One of the things that we've created about the company is a vehicle for uh, screening of the population, but that company effectively is created out of cancer centres in every state and territory. So we have 12 cancer centres literally representing every state and territory of the eight states and territories in Australia. And we have a further eight centres which will be joining by the middle of 2021. To create this, We've been very aggressively pursuing partnerships with uh, both academic research organizations, but more importantly with industry, because we believe that the best trials that are being conducted today, the ones that have the most promise for benefiting patients, actually don't come out of the academic sector, but come out of the private industry sector and contract research organizations. But the program is widely supported by both the federal and state government systems within Australia, as well as from the community. This just shows our progress to date. So uh, we've now crossed 3,200 patients screened in the past two years. We are agnostic to any cancer type. So we're well as suited to both histotype specific trials, for example, in lung cancer, but we're also well suited to picking up the pan cancer opportunities that are increasingly becoming available through, uh, through uh, with FDA approvals of four drugs now that cross uh, multiple histo histologic subtypes on the basis of a common genetic aberration. A lot of the patients that are taking part in these programs are actually typically neglected. So they represent essentially a, a, a market in the cancer population uh, which has typically been neglected and whom we believe precision oncology principles will make a particularly big difference to. I'll just touch upon this uh, topic, which is uh, a particular sub-program we're performing in lung cancer at the moment uh, on a thousand patients with newly diagnosed metastatic lung cancer. We believe the future of uh, healthcare in oncology will involve the universal access to this genomic profiling. And this trial is designed to answer the questions that governments and regulators need. Uh, so what we're doing in this study is to compare single gene testing, exa exactly as I was saying earlier, Susan, about the testing of uh, patients in conventional models that exist today and comparing that if you were to use comprehensive genomic profiling. We're trying to answer the question, what's the cost of doing that? How many more targets do we identify? Do we identify them earlier in the patient journey? And does that translate into benefits for patients? And we're doing that at the same time as weaving in a suite of clinical trials that we've developed and which we are developing in partnership with industry to be able to deliver benefits to the patient populations that are flowing through. And this is both Commonwealth supported, but as well as heavily industry supported as a, as a specific sub program of the molecular screening and therapeutic study. So you can see that we have a whole suite of trials here. To the mm -hmm. left, you see currently government approved drugs, which are, um, for example, EGFR inhibitors, which are very commonly used in lung cancer. We have interesting sub programs in resistance, which I think is where the field is headed. On the right, you see drugs which are not currently available on our pharmaceutical benefit scheme, but where we have good evidence from the NCCCN and other guidelines of clinical benefit, which we're trying to bring through trials to the patients taking part in this program. But G12C is not there, is it? So the reason why G12C, which is such an exciting and very specific target, particularly in non-small cell lung cancer, is because we have an industry trial which is currently going on, which is directed towards registration. It's a randomized study performed by Amgen, and we are supporting the referral of patients from this program onto that trial so we don't have to provide uh, cover for that trial, so to speak, within our own program. That, that's one of the intentions of our program of work is to try and cover the entire landscape so that not one patient is left behind, that we learn from every possible opportunity to be able to advance drug development and bringing those drugs to the patient population. In that case, fortunately, that program is so well developed that we can support an external trial rather than having to run that internally. So what I wanted to share with you now is a little bit of the first two or three years worth of experience on the program. We've now reached 3,182 patients. Um, we were originally projected to reach 3,000 over a five-year period, but we've reached that at the two-year milestone, which tells you that we're screening faster than expected. And consequently, we're raising resources to be able to expand the scope of the program to 8,000 patients overall. Of the 3,182 that have come through the program so far, we've delivered molecular tumor board reports on profiling to almost 2,500 
and an, an astonishing 1,500 plus of those patients have had an actionable mutation for which there is a drug either in development or currently approved. In parallel with that, we have our own uh, suite of basket trials that we have more than 20 clinical sub-studies in development covering more than 450 patients. We've been following up this population to see what the benefit is. And this is, of course, one of the reasons the federal government is very interested in this and committed towards increasing clinical trials. Because of, of the 1,587 patients who've taken part in the program and who have more than 12 months of follow-up so we know what's happened to them, we've been able to treat uh, about 20% or 321 of those patients with a match therapy as a consequence of screening. Most of that's been done through trials. And you can see to the right that we can show that participation in those trials is showing benefit to patients with a highly significant improvement in lifespan from, this is overall lifespan from 54 weeks to 81 weeks and more than six months extension in survival from simply taking part in trials. This is why we so passionately believe that supporting clinical trials should be a standard of care for all uh, patients with advanced cancer. We've also developed an interesting algorithm that matches the outputs of genomic screening. All those molecules and mutations, they don't mean much to patients or to clinicians in many cases. What patients and clinicians, and indeed all of us want, is to link that to identifying the right treatments on those trials. And we've developed a highly sophisticated algorithm, which we call Topograph. That algorithm matches the clinical trials that we have available and which we are supporting through our programs to uh, the mutational profile for each individual patient. And that looks like this. So here you see a typical report. This is a patient with prostate adenocarcinoma. Um, you can see here that there's a high tumor mutational burden picked up on our profiling. And you see the remainder of the classical uh, mutations that we see in this pa patient population with a Tempris 2 erg mutation. That's a typical of uh, prostate adenocarcinoma. And down the bottom, you see our recommendation to taking part in this case in a immunotherapy trial because high tumor mutational burden is known or is, seems likely to predict response. And we want to generate more evidence in this space. So that brings me back to discussion about how we're very keen to support George Clinical in bringing new trials to Australia. We'll be screening another 5,000 patients minimum, and we'll work very hard to increase that number even further over the next three years. We've been able to do that over the first three, so we see no reason why that shouldn't increase, but conservatively, at least another 5,000 patients with advanced cancer. They, can, they are participating in pan cancer programs, but also in lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and other sub programs that we've developed over the past three years. Those patients are all screened using a common platform and screened from all parts of the country. We have a molecular tumor board which personalizes the report and matches a recommendation against a trial. And the trials that George Cl Clinical will hopefully bring to Australia will be amongst the most recommended trials if they're matched against the appropriate patient. And this, in this way, we achieve some of that, in practice, what I described earlier in principle, that by taking responsibility for providing the screening of a much larger population, that in effect, you can reduce the cost of conducting those trials, but because the government is underwriting the costs of finding the patients across the entire country. So Susan, look, um, it's been a lot to go through. Um, I, ho I hope the concepts have come across about how we're trying to support and work with George Clinical to provide precisely the right ecosystem for efficiently conducting biomarker-driven clinical trials. Uh, maybe we should open up for some questions. Yeah, I see. I do see some questions coming in. Um, so, if uh, I say that there were fifteen centers that are participating right now, if I wanted to keep my costs down, or there was a reason that I wanted to consider using, how can you help me minimize so I don't have to open, open all fifteen sites? Because we know that that is a, a a burden sometimes. Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? Um, so, of course, in the current model you would go to one of those centers or maybe two or three and you would support, you would pay those centers to conduct screening of their population. And then they would go into the trial open at that center. In the model that we're proposing, you would have the screening going on at 15 centers around the country and the patients would be identified at any one of those centers. Once we make a recommendation, then those patients would be referred to the small number of centers where you would actually be running the trial. You would choose the centers that are in the biggest population centers because 
you would like to inconvenience as few patients as possible to travel to take part in the trial. But you can actually have a much greater, higher ratio of screening centers to actual trial centers by that model. It means that a patient treated in Darwin, for example, who has a very rare but a highly promising mutation, would be notified that there was a trial being run by George Clinical uh, at, let's say, Brisbane, and then they would, they would, the budget that would be involved there would be essentially a travel budget to take that patient for treatment at the centre. We also have a teletrials initiative, Susan, so it is possible, and we plan to develop a model in which for the appropriate types of trial, particularly, say, oral medications, we can actually treat those patients at the remote centre without necessarily activating that as the primary site. And that way, um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to make the whole process of participating in clinical trials less uh, less of a barrier, particularly for rural Australians. We're seeing some questions come in about um, prioritizing markers. Um, if we find a patient that has more than one potentially actionable or eligible or is eligible for multiple trials, so how are we prioritizing? So that's a very good question again. Um, I would say that it is less common to find multiple than it is to find a single one for the majority of patients, as you might appreciate. 62% is about the rate which we identify at least one biomarker. So for, for in that situation, the molecular tumor board is critical because the molecular tumor board brings experts who are up to date uh, beyond the databases that we use to make decisions. There's often data emerging continuously which suggests which may be the best and most promising options. We integrate that information in a patient-centered fashion, along with our prioritization of the trials for our partners. And so where we have a partner who's supporting the program, taking part in this program, we uh, prioritize that along with the patient's interest in making the top recommendation for participation in that trial. I have a question while some others are coming in um, as well. So I see that you have foundation and Illumina. Um, how are you? Are you working with both and how are you selecting which to use or, uh, you know, where you're actually really having the test run? How is that set up? Yes, so that's, again, a good question. Um, we're, we're not, uh, we think the technology has matured to the point where there are multiple pretty competitive alternatives in the marketplace. And we are not wedded to any one company in providing these solutions but rather to getting the best value uh, to be able to screen as many patients as possible. And in particularly in this phase, we're, we're, we're open to exploring as many different options for screening platforms as we can evaluate. In this case, we've chosen an FDA approved platform, uh, Foundation Medicine CDX, but also a highly competitive platform in the Illumina TSO 500. The second thing is that the platforms are evolving incredibly fast as new drugs are emerging. The most striking example I can think of, actually, is the uh, NTRAC fusions, which have absolutely made it clear that you can get really significant, long-lasting responses in patients using drugs that target fusion genes, like NTRAC fusions. But there are others. You can think about ALK, for example, as a fusion where you can quintuple survival in lung cancer by attaching the right drug to targeting ALK fusions. I think fusion genes and therefore the detecting of fusion genes via an RNA-based component to these panels is emerging as an absolute must-have in any competitive panel. So I think it's going to be important continually in having, first of all, a diverse marketplace of competing platforms, all of which meet a certain standard for being fit for purpose and comparing them continuously. Now, a, a related question, which might be of importance to our audience, Susan, is, well, supposing my trial uses a particular platform, how does that work? Well, the reality is, I think that's where you're headed, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. So this is how I have prepared a slide because I think that's a very good question. So the costs of screening don't relate to the 20 patients that you want to find. They relate to screening 1,980 patients who don't have the target. So in the case that a particular trial for consistency purposes, say going to the regulatory bodies, mandates a particular type of test, we would screen using these uh, extremely capable and fit for purpose assays across the population. And once we get a signal that we've identified the population with the target, that 20 out of the 2,000, then we can repeat the assay 
or indeed refer the patient in for screening through a central laboratory attached to the trial. But of course, you're doing that on 20 patients. So just think of the ratios here. If it costs $2,850 to perform this, the test, then the cost of the test is reduced from 2,850 times 2,000 to now 100 fold. So you're saving 100 fold on the cost that you have to put aside for doing that particular test that you, you mandate is required for your study. We are taking care of the costs of finding the patients in the first place. I guess one of the things that is a question that's questions that come up are are the trials updated on a regular basis? How do the centers know about the George clinical trials, for instance, um, particularly if maybe the patients have been tested um, a little ways back? And you know, because obviously you're getting tests currently, and if there's a match, there's there's a trial, but a trial could be ongoing. Yeah, so that's the, that's the reason why we're, we've made this really quite profound change to the way in which we issue our reports. The majority of molecular tumour uh, reports, genomic profiling reports, focus upon mutations, the, the genomics, if you like, which we just don't think is the, pri is the primary purpose of the test. We think the primary purpose of the test is to find options for treatment. So on page one of our report, after briefly summarizing the mutation profile in a third, perhaps a half a page at most, we then get straight to, this is our top recommendation. And you can see down the bottom of this particular report on the basis of tumor mutation burden that we have recommended one of our most trials. But imagine now this is a George clinical trial. We have a George clinical trial, which is targeting tumor mutational burden. Then the George clinical trial would be the top recommendation that goes to the clinician. Now, we're never going to be in a position to tell the clinician that they have to refer to that trial. They have to make the final decision because, as you know, patients may have many factors which may leave them ineligible for the trial or inappropriate for the trial. And that final decision we always leave with a referring clinician. But what we do is make sure that the top-ranked recommendation are the trials that we support. And George Clinical Trials... Uh, which we support would become a part of our in-house prioritized list of recommendations for to going back to the clinician. So then is there a contact um, name somehow associated with that for the site? Um, are we yes. receiving report? Um, so we have, we understand about matches that are available yes. to us. Great question. So um, let's, let's deal with the, uh, so we have a hyperlink so that we try to make it as easy as possible for the referring clinician just to do it one click, get onto the trial to find out whether or not the recommend, the recommended trial is the one for the patient. Because there's lots of other details, as you know, that go into the eligibility and exclusion criteria for a trial. Right. Mm -hmm. One, for example, is distance. So there may be patients who just can't travel for various reasons, but that, that might be super relevant. And in fact, what we do is we try to recommend trials based on the distance in kilometers as the crow flies from the, where their postcode where they live. So we try to take that into account. And that's a sort of nuance about the level of detail that Topograph provides in matching the appropriate clinical, clinical trials um, here. So our model at the moment is that there's a, a kind of network access fee. So to, you, you pay for sort of entry into the network as a part of a most suite of trials. That's, that's sort of a, a, a fee sort of to enter. But th from that point onwards, essentially it's pay for service. So the, the patients that we identify, that we make a recommendation to support a George clinical trial, we will notify you through a live portal. That it's a, a, updated live and accessible by our industry partners who are running the trial. So you can see the running total of patients that are identified. And of course, that gives you a kind of denominator of the patients that you would expect them to go on to be referred on to the trial. That ratio is not necessarily, it isn't 100% almost for certain for the reasons I mentioned that there are many other factors that might be relevant to a clinician making the final decision about recommending it, referring a patient onto a trial. But at least you have live information about the screen population and the identification rate. So mm -hmm. that's one way in which we make sure that we connect both sides of the equation, both the study centers, but also the referring clinicians. And so, and then there's a question that's come in about our, about George Clinical's involvement and how that would work. Um, we would be approached with um, the, you know, a synopsis or we would be helping to write that protocol and developing that synopsis and so forth. And um, 
we would then work with um, Omiko to basically share that information that would be um, needed to help identify the patients. We would then do our job to evaluate those sites, um, many of which we probably already know and have evaluated, um, but for that particular trial, we will be doing that same work. It just streamlines, in my mind, the, uh, the way we identify the patients um, and we're getting a more targeted approach that way. So David, have I summarized that um, in a way that you would agree? Exactly. That's how we would like to see the partnership. The, one, the other thing that we can provide, let's suppose there's a client who wants to perform a trial of their compound um, and they know the population they're after. In that early negotiation phase, we can provide actual data about the frequency with which the target is already being identified in our cohort. So mm -hmm. we say we've identified 15 patients who fit the eligibility criterion that you're looking for over the past three years. We can then project based around our current screening rates how long it would take to find the patients required to populate the trial. That so gives you us with enrollment rates and things exactly. like that. Yeah. It's confidence about what you might expect to see based around real data, not theoretical data. Yeah, and that, that certainly is helpful. A question comes up a lot um, where, we're always, where we're trying to project, uh, project those enrollment rates. And you can look at historical data, you can look at previous trials, but um, when we talk, you know, I understand we're going to have that back and forth discussion to help to better, you know, best match with this particular trial. Susan, I think there was a question, if I saw it, um, that came in asking about when um, in the Australian landscape, there's, an, uh, there's a, how we think the regulatory bodies are going to make the transition from single gene testing to genomic. I did see that someplace too. Clearly, one of the problems with health technology assessment in this type of test, the genome, comprehensive genomic profiling, is the fact that the typical way we evaluate the benefit of a test is you link it to the intervention that then really delivers the benefit. The problem with comprehensive genomic profiling is that one test can have, as you can see, an incredibly broad range of therapeutic benefits that flow through. And some of those benefits are very hard to capture with health technology assessment. For example, they might just improve the quality of pathology. So you get these pathognomonic fusions that say this cancer is of this type. That's not a, a, a treatment, uh, uh, it doesn't impact upon treatment in the molecular sense, but it does increase the accuracy of clinical diagnoses just by being routinely available. And of course, it doesn't deal with the support of clinical trials, which are not part of standard of care and not usually taken into account by the regulators. So I think this is a very problematic area for governments in general. I think What's changed over the last 20 years, as I said earlier, is the fact that simply taking part in a trial these days with rational drug development is an incredibly important treatment option for our patients. For, I'll just give you one example. <clears throat> this is in my experience. I'm a sarcoma specialist, so I treat sarcoma patients. The frontline NCCN recommended therapy for metastatic soft tissue sarcoma is doxorubicin which has a response rate of 17 to 23%. Now, the astonishing fact is that if I refer my, that patient onto a phase one trial of a biomarker directed therapy, and if the patient has that biomarker, current predictions are that they have a 30 plus percent chance of response. I just think of that. When I was a young resident, phase one mm -hmm. trials quoting 5% objective response from taking part in a phase one trial. A phase one trial of a biomarker drug offers better response rates now than our and best. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. absolutely critical that we support more clinical trials of these wonderful new drugs coming through. And in fact, also that we do it efficiently. We need to do this more efficiently because that's the only way that all of this science is going to be sustainably affordable by the whole system. So mm -hmm. we're very develop partnership models that enable more trials to come to cancer patients. And uh, the best trials, as I've said from the very outset, are industry-sponsored contract research organization run trials because they're going straight for the, uh, the end point, getting the drug to market. Now, are you working with um, the institutions? Um, there's a question that came in. Can you describe the collaboration with large oncology institutions in Australia? Clearly, when we've developed this uh, this um, this network, the, the partners to Omico, the shareholders, if you'd like, literally, 
in this. We've chosen the major cancer centres in every state and territory. So, for example, in Victoria, Australia's largest cancer centre, single cancer centre, the Peter Mac, is a member of our network and on our board. Um, so, but we recognise that even the largest single cancer centre in our country sees about a quarter of the total volume of cancer patients going through the country. And for a whole lot of reasons, which you will understand, both for the patients who don't go to the one centre but travel are treated elsewhere throughout the network, it's absolutely pivotal that we give them the chance to take part in research-led uh, evidence-based care delivered by clinical trials. So um, we, we have assembled all of the centres in the country and brought them together to participate in the program. And I, I guess you noticed that I said that there were 12 cancer centres that were currently part of our network in the first two years, but there were eight additional cancer centres that were coming online in 2021. We're having more centres, of course, want to take part in the network, and we're building that uh, progressively for forward. So we're trying to get essentially the largest population centres that are delivering cancer care to be part of an extended and growing network. See another question is the cost of initial um, molecular genomic profile paid for um, by the, you know, funded by other means? Yeah, so, so that is the central message of this. The federal government of Australia is paying to undertake screening of patients to increase the number of patients who access the technology. And what we're here today to discuss is how to take advantage of the $50 million that's being poured by the federal government into doing that to support the bringing of new trials to this country. We, Australia hasn't been affected by COVID to the extent that many countries, unfortunately, have been affected. So our system, which not only delivers excellent healthcare outcomes for cancer patients in the first place, is also relatively free to find patients and enroll them and treat them on trials. And this advance where we specifically, we're aiming at solving the problem of finding rare cancer patient populations in an affordable and efficient way, is another element that should make Australia an attractive destination for trials. And of course, George Clinical, we see as a, as a flagship bearer for Australian clinical trials, and we are here to support George Clinical in delivering that benefit. And that's federally supported. What if there's a client that comes to um, George and they're unsure about the marker, the, the correct biomarker, the right diagnostic test? Is that something that you can, that Omico can help with um, as we're, I guess, you, maybe uh, developing the trial or designing it maybe? Yeah, again, a fantastic question. One that we've been thinking about. So a lot of this is sort of down in black and white. We understand pretty much what we're proposing here. But a really attractive idea would be if there was a new biomarker, one that's not present on the panels. And I think that's what the question is directed to. Right. So if, uh, let, me, let me give an example, a practical example. Let's suppose there's a drug that's designed to target a new ca cancer mechanism so early that it's not part of the current you know, FDA approved panel sort of list. Right. Uh, let's suppose it's got to do with telomeres, for example. Let's suppose that cancers have different mechanisms of maintaining their telomeres, which is critical to carcinogenesis and therefore makes a good target. Could we screen for telomere abnormalities? Well, why not? We've got the patients coming through the program. We source the blocks that perform the comprehensive genomic profiling. It would simply be a question of intervening earlier with a customized assay to screen for the frequency and cancer types associated with abnormalities in whatever the telomere mechanism that we're interested in. We're, that's, that's actually attractive to us because part of our mission is to advance knowledge as, as well. So going earlier in the diagnostic process to support companies which are going for a new target is something that we'd love to do. It's actually scientifically something that we would be totally supportive of. Of, you know, that's absolutely a given. Is this because you're holding on to um, tissue that you're able to test again? Um, so, you know, I mean, I know that they're probably sending you if they're getting part of a block or something, you know, a small tissue sample. Can you test that again for something else? Yes. So we, we can conduct those studies, but they're probably better off conducted uh, prospectively rather than retrospectively. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if, if we obviously uh, sometimes the tissue very limiting on patients and we're operating at the margins of available clinical mm -hmm. material. Yes. Tiny biopsies, fine little aspirates and things like that. We have a 90 plus percent success rate with the DNA based component of the assay. So we're very satisfied with that, but it often leaves very little left over and we don't want to take that away from the pathology labs that are supporting the program. Mm -hmm. However, 
if there is a specific assay that we want to perform, say a, an immunohistochemical assay or even a new assay looking at telomeres, for example, then we would, at the time that we were cutting sections in genomic profiling, we would take the requisite material up front whilst the block was in our possession before going back. We can go back for a good purpose. We can go back and ask for the blocks to be resent so that we could perform profiling if there's a specific question that's worth going for, and we have done that, yes. Okay. And um, what about liquid? Um, that's, that's an area that we hear more and more about lately. Um, yeah. So liquid biopsy, and especially when there's limited tissue samples with some of these, um, some of these tumors. Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a, an area that we're, ex an example of where we're interested in the science of it all. We think liquid mm -hmm. biopsies still are probably not competitive with going for the primary tissue in terms of delivering a result to a patient quickly. But as you know, in 10% of cases, perhaps higher, um, there is inadequate tissue. And we think there's an opportunity for what we call reflex testing, where we're doing liquid biopsies on patients who just don't have enough primary material to save them from undergoing a new biopsy, which sometimes can be put the patients at risk unnecessarily. And I think the technology is mature enough to be asking that question. The second area where liquid biopsies are potentially very important is in resistance. As you know, for example, in EGFR mutations, the drugs have now passed to generations where they can now specifically target first generation resistance mutations like T790M EGFR mutations. Mm -hmm. And so for that, pop, for that question, it's helpful to have serial samples being taken. Often accessing biopsies of primary tumor is really problematic. Liquid biopsies become very attractive at monitoring yeah. the emergency. And yes, we, we are very interested in, in uh, liquid biopsies. In fact, I should say, that as taking part in the trial, we get a blood sample, including a streck tube spun down plasma fraction, as well as the blood component, which is present on all patients. And so that's something we can definitely look at, look at across the entire cohort. I would say there's a couple of questions there about consented to reuse the tissue. This is a research, a population-based research study where we are absolutely, the patients are consented to future unspecified research purposes, and we, can, we do that all the time. There's another question there, Susan, which asks about being in a position to understand how genomic information affects standard of care. We have a long-term follow-up unit attached to our study, which means we track all patients. All 3,182 to date are being tracked over time to generate the sort of outcome data I shared with you earlier. We believe that following the population as a whole outside or inside clinical trials is a really important part of generating the evidence base the real world evidence base that governments and regulators will need to see in order to make decisions about the investments in this as a future model of care. There's another question about Omico collaborating with other organizations okay. similar. So yes, indeed. So we're working with Rich Shilsky for Taper and Emil Wurst for DRUP. And uh, both DRUP and Taper are collaborating with CAPTURE, the Canadian-based national initiative and we're very keen and we recognize the importance of working with international organizations to get the numbers up to be able to accelerate progress. Even across a population of 24 million, really, uh, you know, we, we need to do this internationally to maximize uh, understanding patterns in populations that are so rare that that's the best way to achieve progress. And yeah, absolutely, we have international best practice in that regard. I think it's been discussed, how do we centralize this? How do we have this one, giant with one database and um, this is the definitely that direction that's being taken so it's, it's very very exciting yeah so that's absolutely true actually you, you remind me to mention the fact that we've developed a sub program i showed you the <laughs> sub program. we have a sub program in lymphoma and leukemia for precisely that reason so yeah. we, we, we don't see any reason to stay on the solid side as they say the solid mm -hmm. side of cancer we think this should apply the general principles apply to all malignancy so what haven't you covered? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to have a sub-program in brain cancers and in, uh, and in sarcomas in my own area, but that's just being selfish, I think. But in brain cancers, the rationale, the rationale behind brain is that it's got dreadful outcomes and therefore anything that makes a difference in that population is something devoutly to be wished, as they say, and also it'll have a big impact in terms of the regulators prioritizing uh, cancers with poor outcomes. 
And the other group is cancers of unknown primary. So we haven't got there quite yet, Susan, but we're actively working on trying to develop sub-programs with expert investigators to champion those subgroups within the program. We think you get this orthogonal weave between the molecular classification and the way we've always done research through histotypes. We need to get that weave nice and strong to get the best quality fabric out of the system. Excellent. Well, David and Susan, thank you so much for the engagement today. Thank you to the audience for such a and wonderful stream of questions here uh, to keep this session so very much interactive. But again, David and Susan, thank you so much for taking the time and the preparation for this webinar today. For all attendees, we will be making a recording uh, that you can stream of this version for any colleagues who may not have been able to attend uh, the session live today. We're well aware of there's a, a great spread of time zones around the world uh, where George Clinic operates trials. So that is be uh, something you can easily share via email or LinkedIn uh, with anyone in your peer group, and we encourage you to do so. Uh, and that recording will be available here in the next day or so. Please keep in touch with George Clinical uh, online. If you're not following the uh, organization through LinkedIn, we'd highly encourage you to do that. You can also visit georgeclinical.com to sign up for the George Clinical News, a monthly newsletter covering the CRO marketplace overall. And we will obviously keep you up to date on future webinars planned uh, in a variety of areas throughout the year. Uh, for any business development inquiries, specifically to oncology or frankly, any therapeutic area, please contact Matthew Rebold. His information, email, and phone number are on screen at this time. And once again, thank you to all of you attendees for taking time out of your day. Uh, David and Susan, thank you for keeping uh, the session entertaining and engaging.